All right, ladies and gentlemen, today I've got Rob McCullum, my favorite villain of anything over the last 20 years of any kind of medium is the guy that you did, a little character named Stain. How are you, Rob? Doing well. Thanks for having me, man. Oh, man, this is a pleasure. Uh, it's fantastic, man. Where uh, You said Texas, right? Is where you're from? Yeah, I am, I am, I am coming to you live from the bowels of Dallas, Texas. Uh, I've, I've driven through there a couple of times. I mean, I was stationed out in San Diego, so going you know, cross country, I found out that Texas has the best speed limit because there's never any cops there. I think it says 80 is the speed limit, which means you could do at least 90 to 100. Uh, yeah, it's just it, a suggestion. Yeah, it very rarely it is super flat. So all you gotta do is hit cruise control and don't hit a fucking deer and then you're, you're golden. So yeah, it is not exciting. It is not a visually stimulating drive. I remember I've got a lot of I work with a company in the UK that does a lot of things and occasionally will bring crew in like cameramen. And when they realize you can drive as fast as you can <laughs> for nine hours and not leave the state of Texas, their yeah. minds were blown. They're like, I could, I could drive from England to Moscow in that amount of time. I'm like, yes, yeah. yes, you could. <laughs> Welcome to Texas. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I buried the lead there a little bit, man, but uh, Stain, how did you get cast for this he's such a fantastic character and he gets his legs cut out from him just when it's starting to get good man uh how did you get onto this character well so early on in my hero i'd auditioned for for several of the characters and it just didn't come in time you know they they kind of try to share it out based on who's doing what in other shows and that sort of thing and schedule availability and also because just people were just better than me but i didn't get some of the early big roles but we all knew that my hero was going to be huge. It was, yeah. it was like, no, even as it was coming down the pike, everyone was like, this is the next big thing. This is huge in Japan. This is going to be huge in the United States. Um, this is going to be a big deal. And uh, so then randomly I got called in and I didn't know what it was for. And the director Colleen Clinkenbeard was like, hey, I've got this guy. He's actually not in a whole lot of episodes. It's not a huge amount of time in, for recording but he's, he's an important character. And so what I want you to do, and I hadn't, I hadn't seen anything of that season. I didn't know what was coming. I didn't know anything about him. And, uh, and she's like, I want you to audition for it, but we're just gonna go ahead and do the session. And if it gets approved, we'll already be done. Cause I think, I know I want you to do this, but it has to go through all the levels and layers. Yeah. So I went in completely cold, no idea, no, no history of the, of the character or anything. And she's just like, just try this. We threw a couple of different takes at it. She's like, yep, that's the one. Do more of that. I'm sending it in. And the, the first episode, he's just like watching from a distance and making like those kind of very tongue-centric grunting noises. Yeah. It was just a lot of like, ah. she's like, perfect. That's what I want. I'm like, okay, what have I just done? And left and then came back. She's like, okay, you're staying. You're the villain of this season and also kind of the person that changes the tone of the show from this point going forward. So I had no clue. And then did the deep dive and realized like, oh yeah, this does, even though he's a small guy, he's only there for a short amount of time. And also I didn't realize it was so short. I mean, she said it wasn't a lot of lines, but we finally get to the episode with the big, his big speech, his big moment. And then he just locks up and stands there. I thought my video was glitching. <laughs> I'm like, oh, he's, he's locked he's not and they're like no no that's all that's all and i'm like all for this episode like, well kind of all for all that we know <laughs> uh, so it was very unfulfilling as an ending and also i always try not to look too much ahead because mm -hmm. i don't want to know things i'm not supposed to know yet and uh, i had a, one an early director that i worked with was like don't read the manga i know everyone says you should be a good actor and a good fan and know ahead of time but i don't want if your guy is supposed to be the sweet guy next door and we find out 37 episodes later that he's the serial killer yeah i don't want you playing serial killer i want you playing sweet guy next door until it's time so i kind of gotten in a habit of not reading ahead so i was very upset to find out that stain's stain's whole arc ended un so, so unceremoniously Dude, when so i shit on this show for so long i was just one of those guys because I don't come from an anime background. If you could tell, I'm a huge Ninja Turtle guy. I mean, I got them all over my arm and my body. I, I do uh, get that sense from your background, yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 
I've said it a couple of times. My wife says when she walks in here, it's really like a sickness vice, you know, a collection or any kind of thing. She just looks at it. She's like, Ugh, you know, look gross. Um, but so for the longest time, I just did not give this show the attention or even the respect I think it really deserved. And everything changed like most people this year with this pandemic that's going on. Right. So I, I work in the food industry. And they told us to go home and not come back. They're like, ah, just come back whenever we can, right? So we all thought it was two weeks. Um, so for the ter- first two weeks, it was fun. We were, me and my kid were sitting here, we're watching stuff. We always liked watching movies and cartoons together. And then I just happened to flick on and leave it on because it, Hulu had this autoplay feature. So right. we were watching Dragon Ball and then it switched over to this because we'd finished Dragon Ball. And then I was like, oh, this fucking show. So I just let it in the playground because I, I, I let it play. I was unloading the dishwasher. And then I heard a dude that I was like, holy shit, is that Piccolo? And I look over because it was just playing, it was playing the dubbed because the 10 year old, he can read, but I was just having to explain stuff to him in Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. I was like, fuck it, let's just watch it in English so I don't have to sit here and pause it every 30 seconds. Right. I start watching and it's All Might coming up. I'm like, holy shit, because Piccolo is my favorite anime character from Dragon Ball Z of all time. And Chris, fantastic. And once I saw that, I was hooked immediately. Um, and we started watching this. And then we get to your character arc. And uh, not sadly, I don't know where he's at. He's right over there. But Shigaraki is my dude. He's my favorite, favorite uh, character at that time. And then it you know, morphed into a racer with uh, Aizawa and then Bakugo. And then Stain comes in and just completely flips the entire script upside down. And it is one of the most, I don't, craziest scenes because he's only in there, like you said, for like, what, six episodes, maybe? Yeah. Um, very, very short, very, very quickly. But you put an exclamation mark, or this character puts an exclamation mark on those six episodes. And like you said, completely changes the fabric of this show going forward. Um, have you since then read further? Um, oh, yeah. And it, it, it is amazing how how the tone, everything just gets more serious. It's like a, it's like a fun, silly, goofy show. And then they decide... We got to grow up. Time, It's time to grow up yeah. and, and, and go in a different direction. And so the the shadow of stain um runs runs long uh and 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 deep but there's also all right spoiler for th- those that are there's there's one scene in in the manga where uh someone's walking through the you know prison for the criminally insane or that with the the arkham of yeah. this of this universe oh, great batman and book. they and they walk past a cell and Stain is in there. It is mm-hmm. the only time, he's not mentioned again, but he, we know he still is alive and in the universe. So I still keep thinking either some, at some point in time, they're gonna need him like Silence of the Lamb style and come <laughs> in and talk to him or, or he's, you know, someone you know, will prove to truly be worthy or Arm- All Might himself will come. And so he's gonna join the good guys. I don't know, but I still hope there's, there's, there's a future for staying somewhere in the, in the universe. So are you hoping for a hello, Clarice? It is good to see you seen for staying. Is that what we're, is that what we're hearing? Is that what you want? That, I think it would be fantastic. I, I mean, they could do them, you know, tie them up and do the whole thing. Well, they got it. They got to put the Hannibal Lecter mask on. They got to have them wrapped up and they got to have yeah, card him in on a dolly, furniture yeah. dolly. Absolutely. I mean, be- I mean, or maybe he still can't move. Maybe he's just locked and they're bringing him in like a statue. Like he's the cardboard cut. They just roll him around like a mannequin. <laughs> well, I, I got to assume. So like I, it's almost the same concept as you. They didn't want you reading ahead. I bought probably the first, 18 19 mangas and then i started reading them and then once i got to pretty much where the show left off i was like all right i'm not reading any further because this book is fantastic but this show is what really hooked us and i don't want to be surprised i don't want to be shocked i don't want to be right taken out of the moment you know when that happens um when, when the next season comes up um but seeing that where the way they left him i thought he was dead up until i read yeah. to where stain was at and then i can't remember what they was it just he punctured his lung essentially is that is that what it was and then he kind of stopped or yeah he basically the there's there's lots of different theories they didn't answer all of the questions and those of you that are deeper in the manga will know more than i did but basically he just overpowered and blew out his battery Mm, like his body couldn't take it his his, he just he just locked up (laughs) he he overheated and locked up because he got too worked up with the with the expenditure of power and it did physical things to him and mental things to him and 
the things with his his quirk. So, I mean, I think we still know that there's a chance that something could change, but nothing yet. Now, have you watched the show in its entirety since you've worked on it at this point? I have watched a lot of it, not all of it. I have so many friends that are in it that I'll watch their art for a while and then, but you know, as you said, as much time as, as COVID provided, there's still a lot of content out there. So I have not watched every, every single moment. I know people are like, you're a terrible fan. I was like, yeah, that's my job. Yeah, I don't, you don't go home and just you don't ho go home and just cook for people that aren't in your family. That's work. You're gonna wait. Well, I mean, I I do, I do. I always have like friends over and shit like that because they're guinea pigs. I can essentially try anything I really want to, and 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 your your industry is completely different. I I love talking. I'm pretty sure you guys like talking for your job, but you hate having to do this extra shit. And sometimes it's fun and rewarding and shit like that. Um, but for me, I get to sit here and try some stuff because I got a, a ten year old and a wife. They're not picky, but they also aren't super, super adventurous when it comes to food. Um, so it's nice getting a whole bunch of different people's palates over here because I can try this, try that, do this, do that. Plus, I really, really love it. And it's it's like my it's like my dojo, my my my, my Zen spot. Right. Yeah, can, that's your therapy. Yeah, I can decompress um, and I don't have to worry about anybody yelling or cussing at me because, you know, somebody's food is 10 minutes late or some shit like that. So it's fantastic. Yeah, they're not paying you. They take what they get. No, no. If anything, I'm paying them because, uh, you know, I'm paying for the food. I'm making it. They're eating it. But in a sense, it's it's fun because it's it's this collective group thing. And I get to sit here and try shit. And then if it's good, it's great. I get to, you know, sit on top of my mountain. If it's shitty, I don't sleep that night. But it is what it is. Right? All right. So what's the what's the I'm sw slipping into interviewer mode because that's what I used to do. What uh, what is the the most surprisingly positive creation you've come up with over over lockdown? What is your pandemic biggest win? Um, I wouldn't say too, too creative because during this pandemic, I, I used to think food was one way as far as uh, whenever I would cook. Like I had a specific idea of culture when it came to food, right? Or the way I thought about food. And then I started thinking when I had so much time to play around, I, I could just sit here and do what I wanted to do vice what somebody was telling me they wanted me to cook. Um, I learned balance. And that sounds completely weird. And it sounds like it's something that's overlooked. But with me and food, it's, I used to think that, oh man, it's got to have this punch or it's got to have this. And then I would start finding out when I started eating things and tasting things that one component would just be too much, right? You would have like, say guacamole, it's super easy to make, right? It's avocados, lime, onions, tomatoes, garlic, serranos and cilantro, and then salt, right? And maybe some black pepper, depending on where you come from in a specific region of Mexico. Some people use it and some people don't. And then I would go and sit here and take, well, I don't want this huge lime punch right off the bat, or I don't want this super, super fragrant cilantro right off the bat, or I don't want this heat. I want everything to be level, but I want everything to enhance each other, right? So during this, long story short, during this pandemic, I really learned balance and I learned how to elevate my game with something very, very small and something very, very rustic or homely. Um, you know, so that's, that's probably what I got most out of this time being so away you discovered you discovered subtlety. That's yeah. really good, Julian. That's good. This is progress. That, it is, man. I mean, it's a 12-step program. I'm on step two or three at this point with uh, cooking, but it's it's fantastic, and it's crazy to see. <laughs> is part of the 12-step that you have to go apologize to people you made crappy food for? Do you have it, to go it, call all of them? <laughs> it's it's insane, like, because what's great about social media is you get to connect with people, right? What's bad about social media is when you post something, right, and you think that that was the greatest thing that little snapshot moment of your life was the greatest thing so I start seeing food pictures post up from a year ago and I sit there I'm like Jesus Christ why did <laughs> I post this shit right like what I knew it tasted like shit like now I look back and I'm like man I'm pretty much banging out freezer meals back in the day but it's crazy to see the growth and the progression the evolution of your character if you will um from where you started to where you're at now and where you could possibly take it um so that's what's really, really cool about all of this, and especially with food, because um, it's a craft, right? You don't come out of the you don't come out of the womb slinging salt and sure. vinegar and all that other stuff. Um, something you got to build up to. Um, well, that's the benefit in 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 my world. We at least have a director to guide us through that thing. <laughs> you're figuring out. You're building your character as you go, which we which we don't often get to do. No, what what is that's something that I always love talking to you guys, and I've had so many voice actors on here. Mainly because you guys are the nicest fucking people in the world because you guys love, I don't want to say you love us, but 
Well, it's crazy what a voice that you do or anybody else I've talked to does. It transports you instantly, almost like food does. It transports you to a time where you laughed or a time where you cried. Um, and, and, and you guys have such a huge part of that. Um, what was the biggest, uh, I guess, hurdle for you as a voice actor? Well, I would say, I mean, I'll go back to your previous point before I answer that question. That's a good question. Um, but I think part of the reason that, that people are always like, oh, anime voice people are so nice and friendly and approachable. It's like, well, none of us thought this was like a path to stardom. Mm -hmm. Like, especially those who are like, I started this in 1998 when Funimation had first come to Texas. Nobody knew anything about anime. Anime conventions weren't really a thing yet yeah. or were just, were just burgeoning. And, and nobody, nobody watched the dub. If you were a fan of Dragon Ball, you watched the you watched the subtitles version, and this was like the the add on that had to be done to sell the DVD. So it was an afterthought. It was super fast. It was low production value. It was you know quick and dirty, and none of us thought it was going to lead to anything because first of all, who knew if anime was going to take off, and second of all, if it did, who knew that anyone was going to care about the the dub actors? Why do you but, think that was? Well. I think the way what changed was that the the anime conventions became uh, a big facet on the on the playing field that that the fan base grew so hot so fast and was so dedicated that people started wanting to get together and yeah. so you know a college in Minneapolis would do something and all of a sudden three hundred people would show up mm -hmm. and then it kept and of course Comic Con was in its ascendancy then too and so anime conventions as a as an offshoot of that began to grow and get more and more involved. Well, they can't fly people over from Japan. Yeah, they can't fly the original actors. Um, that's just cost prohibitive. But what mm -hmm. they can get is the idiot in Dallas who the dub. <laughs> and so it kind of all for a lot of us. A lot of us are just like, wait, this is a thing. This is people are excited about this. And then you start to realize, like, oh, people, people do really care about this. A lot of people watching on on you know Cartoon Network only saw the dub uh and only know our voice with it and at the same time also Funimation got more and more involved and be got better directors and better writers and really started to focus on a quality product as opposed to an add-on to the original because originally it was just distribute the thing that everybody loves from Japan get it out there um and then it became like no this is a separate and different thing we're we're uh, trying to stay true to the original but really make something good as a standalone in the English dub of it and so that quality went up and also just the, the fans wanted more and more contact. And so, you know, you go to a, you go to a conference and they go special guest, this person, and you go, Oh, I guess I'm supposed to care about this person now. And maybe you go back and listen for the first time and go, Oh, wait, Chris Savitz are really cool. I do like all this stuff. I'm going to go rewatch everything that I watched before, but listen to the dub so I can hear what Sabbat does or hear what Mike McFarland does. And so those kind of, those grew, the fandom for those grew and then that kind of took the rest of us along the way with it and but it's still i think it's, it's like none of us thought we were gonna get famous and certainly none of us ever got rich off of being anime dub actors so that's why it's not like a, a it's still exciting to us when someone wants to talk to us about a character especially if it's like someone comes in and is super excited about a thing you did 12 years ago yeah that you barely remember because it was one day but it's their favorite thing of all time. And they have an old DVD copy that they've got, you know, that's battered and bruised and they want you to sign it. Like suddenly you realize like, oh, this is actually impacting people and this. And now we're seeing the, the ability of, of anime as a community to really positively impact kids' lives and, and help people dealing with issues. And I mean, cause there's an anime that's dealing with everything and every yeah. topic under the sun. And so, you know, the, the, the chance for, activism and outreach through that because of the issues of a specific character that you have done. I mean, I've seen some some fellow anime voice actors that have really done amazing things with different communities of, of, of lifting them up and saying, hey, you're not you're not the only one in this situation and there's a lot of ways to deal with it. So it's just, it's been a surprise to all of us. It's been a lovely surprise, but I think that's why everyone's like, sure, <laughs> you wanna do a podcast? I'll do it, call me, let's do it. That, that's fantastic. Cause you're the second person that I've had um, from my hero, I had Lucy a couple weeks ago, uh, Ochako, um, and it, it, it is insane because they always say, you know, don't meet your heroes or don't meet the people you look up to because 
you have this image in your head of like, oh man, this guy's going to be probably like this, or this girl's going to be like this. But you can insert anything in there and kind of like uh, just guess what they'd be like. And, you know, most of the time, nobody really lives up to anybody's expectations. And that's when they say that, you know, don't meet your heroes. But like I said, you guys, and no pun intended on my heroes, um, but you guys, like I said, all lived up to it. And it's, it's been fantastic talking with you guys. Um, and you've done my hero, but you're also young and adult Goten Dragon Ball Z, something that is very, very special to my heart. The first anime I ever watched. Um, and then true hardcore anime fans told me for the longest time that that wasn't anime, which I didn't understand because it came from Japan. It came from the Shonen Jumps. It came from all this crazy stuff. Um, is that, was that the first role as far as, uh, anime that you got involved in? That was the first big one. I mean, like I said, it goes all the way back to, and, and I don't even remember the first one. So if some, if some diligent listener wants to do the research and find my first recorded, I still don't know when it is. Uh, had to be 97 or 98. So we're going way, way back. Um, but that's when uh, Funimation was cranking out a show called Case Closed. It was a show that went on forever and ever. And it also had different people every episode. It was like a different cast of, of criminals uh, each each episode, so it's kind of like a, a, a murder she wrote mm -hmm. for those who hadn't seen it. So just at anyone that had a voice and was in any way connected in Dallas at that period of time was on case close because they're like, we need so many people. Um, so yeah, I think I did that three or four times as different characters and some of the lots of early shows, smaller bits and early shows. Um, Desert Punk was another big one, but then Goten getting to play the you know teenage Goten and and launching the ship and causing that whole next chapter to begin was and again another really small character in terms of the time on screen mm -hmm. but was just really fun to get to do and one of those things that like it never occurred to me that 20 years later people would still be asking me to sign autographs and sign pictures of that character because they love the story so much but yeah so that was one, that was probably one of the first big ones and a big show and of course dragon ball was the was the thing that led the way for everything else that was that was funimation's big push the reason they came to texas was to get that out and get that marketed and and that's why they've been here now for 20 years and that's why so many of the voice actors probably people that you have interviewed are from you know somewhere in texas either the houston yeah. area or the dallas area i know lucy's down in houston um but because that work was here and, and they decided to really commit to, to Texas and the, and the Texas community. And it was like, oh God, I guess we gotta find some voice actors. <laughs> now, I, I've only driven to Texas a few times, um, but each time, each time you drive through there, you always see something different. Um, you guys are like a hodgepodge or a melting pot when it comes to food and culture and all that other stuff, right? Is that something, especially where you're at, did you notice like, are you, before I get started, are you from originally, are originally from Texas? I actually grew up in Arkansas oh. and then, uh, and then went to college in Texas and then stayed here after, after school. Uh, so I've been here for a, a long time now. So I call myself an, a, a, an honorary Texan because it's been well, long enough. I mean, you live anywhere long enough. You got to be from there, right? Absolutely. Um, with, with Funimation, were you there before Funimation kind of came in and blew up? Yes, I was there in the early days and it was actually, uh, uh, Mike McFarlane, who is now, you know, genius director and one of the, the main figures of Funimation, but also Master Yoshi from, from Dragon Ball. Mm -hmm. um, he, he was in there and had started directing early on uh, and voicing a ton of the characters. And we were doing improv comedy in different troops, but we were both doing comedy in Dallas at that time. And I was starting to, to, to do a lot of on camera and voiceover commercial stuff. And he's like, hey, you do voice stuff. You should go do this thing. It doesn't pay any money. And you have to drive to this weird building upstairs from a bank in like an office complex. And it was, it was tape to tape. It wasn't digital yet. So the recording process took forever because you'd record it and then they'd stop and they'd have to spool back. Oh, Jesus. And then replay it. And there was separate like giant quarter inch tapes of, uh, or three quarter inch tapes of like with the Japanese. And then with, it was a crazy system. Um, but again, no one knew it was anything. It was just like, oh, this is the, this is the unemployed actors fund <laughs> way to go pick up 25 bucks when you need to eat that week. And so we all did it. And it was also kind of funny because in those days there was not like a clamoring, like now a clamoring group of people aspiring to be voiceover dub, uh, anime dub actors. You know, now uh, anime Funimation gets a stack of 
300 submissions a week, probably Jesus. wanting to be in these shows. But, but then it was like, literally, oh, um, you're in the building right now. Hey, come down here for a second. Do this guy. Okay. Oh, just, do you need it? Yeah. Okay. Go down here. Do this guy. Cause you happen to be here. And we you didn't know if this was a one-off or a recurring character. It was like, literally you just happened to be there on the day and, and you said, and that's also why everybody sounds kind of similar in those early days. Mm -hmm. Like it was <clears throat> 20 year olds trying to sound like 90 year olds um, <laughs> because they didn't have any 90 year olds to come do those things. So, it was, you know, you'd see hear the same people on eight different shows. Now they have mercifully expanded their talent horizons considerably. But in the early days, it was kind of almost like Saturday Night Live. Like it was just the, it was going to be one of these 12 people who was going to be in there. They were going to get tapped. Uh, when when do you do you think with the introduction to Funimation, their studios and everything like that, them growing that grassroots anime uh, fan base pretty much. I mean, that's how I got introduced to Dragon Ball Z. It was from Funimation. I saw it on on Adult Swim one time. Mm -hmm. All that logo come across. I'm like, oh man, this is the greatest cartoon I'd ever seen at that point. Um, you know, I think it, it sucks saying it, but I think, you know, Dragon Ball Z was like my dad's cartoon at this point. My hero is where it's at now. Um, when, when you were doing this stuff, did you notice a, just a huge explosion of just different cultures coming in? Or was that already starting to take place in Texas before Funimation really started? It actually, it hadn't landed in Texas yet. It was weird. The, the biggest markets for, uh, for the anime that we were distributing in those early days were East Coast and West Coast. Hmm. Um, but then it really did start to grow. And also just kind of like, it, it was part and parcel of the ascendancy of, of, fandom culture yeah. like i said comic-con was going you know star wars had always been a thing and star trek had always been a thing but suddenly and that was like what we nerds watched like that's what i you know us nerdy D, &D players who had star wars action figures like we were the we were the shunned group but now suddenly all those people there it is player's handbook very nice um we were the shunned people but then you know when we got into our 30s some of us started becoming tech billionaires and some of us started running. I clearly didn't because I'm here doing an anime podcast, but <laughs> some people made lots of money and started running studios and opening Apple and all the things that happened. So, so nerd culture became pop culture mm -hmm. and that, and I think anime was just a part of that. It lagged a little behind um, because it was a sub, a subset, but again, you know, anime fans who were fans when they were 12 eventually get jobs and get families and get enough money that they can buy things. And suddenly there was, there's like, oh, there's a legitimate cash mark. I mean, I would love to say it's all for the art, but mm -hmm. follow the money. When there's money there, resources go in to follow it. And suddenly there's like four different places dubbing them. And, and then the internet blows up, kills the DVD market for a couple of years and runs the risk of wiping out Mm -hmm. anime and the, the kind of the whole industry there was a there was a, a rough period of time where the internet piracy but that's when you saw like crunchyroll and the funimation channel start like well okay we're just going to stream it ourselves and make it affordable enough that it's just as cheap to get it from us as from the ripoff guy and we're going to turn it around so fast we can have it before they can have it and so again the industry changed and adapted to follow the money but that also allowed a wider wider audience and a wider group of people i mean i know there's a lot of people that always find it on BitTorrent originally yeah. <laughs> they've they've oh, streamed they've water. stolen it and ripped it down off something but eventually you go like oh i like all these shows and for x number of bucks a month i can subscribe to funimation channel and see all of it anytime i want um that was you know part of the evolution of it but the fan base just continued to grow and to diversify and stayed continued to stay young. It wasn't just the people that loved it 20 years ago that are now 40, like their kids and their kids' kids and, you know, college kids. And the, you see there's always that young, and you go to any convention or any event that we have, there's like an older fan base that knew it back in the day and a new young kind of vibrant group and, and are just as into the characters and just as into the, to the costumes and, and yeah. cosplay and all the things mainly because it's a good story. I mean, that's yeah. the effect that story has. And there's a story for you anywhere and somewhere in anyway, no matter what you're interested in. If you are interested in 
internal corporate hierarchy and the day-to-day drudgery of an accounting job, there's like five animes yeah. out there somewhere for you that deal with that. If you're food prep, there's a million shows for you. As a matter of fact, as much as a foodie as you are, um, God, what was it? Uh, Ian Sinclair starred in the dub of, uh, I'm going to remember it in a second. I'll look it up. But uh, I was in it too. Um, and it's about a, a guy traveling the universe to find the most obscure and interesting foods. Um, all right. Cut this point out because it's embarrassing that I don't remember. I think I even have a poster of it somewhere. Um, I wrote Ian Sinclair food anime. So it'll pop up as soon as we get off the call. Yeah, uh, I'm going to find it right now. Was it a was it a long was it a long going one or was it something? No, it, it, I think it was only a few seasons. But all right, I'm going to find it. I'm going to have to look on. It's bad when you have to go to your own IMDb page to look up the things that you've done. Well, I mean, I don't remember every dish I make. I can't imagine you'd sit here and, especially with the show like One Piece, um, I can't imagine you going like, oh yeah, I remember that episode. I mean, probably the bigger ones you'd probably remember almost 100%. But, you know, when somebody hits you with those, you know, deep cut episodes, remember when this sure. type of thing happened, you know? Well, and I have, when I, when I go to the conventions, I have a list of all of the shows and characters because even if I remember it I'm not going to remember how to spell it correctly and I don't want to sign somebody's commemorative piece with a misspelled name so I have a little cheat sheet there um, before before COVID when you were going to conventions what would you sign most would you sign more Dragon Ball Z more One Piece and now with the with, with My Hero is that kind of equaled out well One Piece and Fairy Tale is another one that was a really big uh, deal for for years and there's another one of those shows that's gone for a long time and I had a main character in fairy tale uh, called Jalal and so that was the big one and then Attack on Titan was kind of another bef before my hero became the thing Attack on Titan was the thing mm -hmm. uh, there was there were weeks when Attack on Titan on Cartoon Network beat like the Daily Show in Jeez. terms of its ratings it was a huge it was a huge show and I had a nice, a, a, a good character on that that became more and more important as the show went on. So a, Attack on Titan was, was huge. Uh, One Piece, as you said, One Piece has gone on for, you know, I think we're up to 750 now on our dub. They're up to a thousand on the Japanese side and it still continues to go. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Well, there's uh, my, my guy that does all my videos, Larry. Uh, he, he's been trying to talk me into Attack on Titan, and I kind of traded off. And he was like, Well, I'll watch the first season of My Hero if you watch the first season of Attack on Titan. And I'm like, Well, shit, if that's all right, all I think that's fair. Yeah, I'll that's go for totally it. Totally fair. Yeah, you know, so plus it'll give me some some kind of perspective or something different to watch that I haven't. Would you say it's for, for a 10 year old? You think pretty good, or is it? It's, I mean, it is, it is bloody and gruesome mm -hmm. but in the way that godzilla picks are buddy oh fantastic i think you're fine like yeah. it's a lot of giant creatures biting people's bodies in half and throwing like them down but it's not you know so it depends on the 10 year old i guess is what you're going to say but if, if you're if your 10 year old is watching mandalorian they can probably oh, yeah. handle attack on titan that cool. would be yeah. my, that That's would be my guess show. If i'm still looking for this i gotta find it Oh, no worries. If every Star Wars, I couldn't get into Star Wars, I couldn't get into Star Trek. It was just, it wasn't, just wasn't for me. Like I said, Turtle Guy, Batman Guy, uh, comic books, that was my stuff. Um, but The Mandalorian, Jesus, is this a fucking fantastic show? I mean, I don't know if it's really called Baby Yoda, because some people get angry when you say Baby Yoda and not the child. Um, but just the fact that they're doing old school puppetry in 2020, and it's a spaghetti Western feel, um, and, yeah, that's the thing I love about it. I love an old, I love an old Western. I love a samurai story yeah. that's told through the old West, which is what this totally is. And uh, uh, the pace of it, you know, it takes its time. It doesn't feel like it has to rush through and and do everything. And one in one episode, it can leave some things hanging. And I, I just really like it. It has those feels of like the old. We watched them in TV when they were in reruns, but like the 1950s, Have Gun, Will Travel. Yeah or the rifleman where he just wanders through a different town each week and saves the day or gets involved and then moves on. Um, but uh, 
Torico. That's what Torico. it's called. Let me write that one down. I've always got my little notepad here. Torico is, is a great, great anime for a foodie like yourself. I think you would appreciate it. I didn't find it online. I just finally remembered it. Um, yeah, Ian Sinclair was the, the lead in that. And uh, the great Aaron Roberts also had a good arc in Torico. Um, the, uh, sorry, I distracted. But yeah, I love, I love those kind of, I love the, that kind of storytelling. And again, it's, it's the same reason that, that anime has continued to be successful is like storytelling wins. Yeah. And if, if the rise of, of really fantastic appointment television, like all of the things that have come out, the, you know, Netflix series and Amazon Prime series and all these kind, you know, the Watchmen, things like that, we realize like, oh, for all of the power that Hollywood thinks it has, the storytellers are still in control. And the good, the good writers are still the ones that are getting attention and getting, getting to do cool things. So I think, it's, I think it's a pretty cool time. I mean, it's also amazing that all of us are just home watching now. So we're paying yeah. more attention. <laughs> like everything is getting watched the week it comes out and binge watch, binge watch through. Um, but it was also an interesting time for, for anime because all the studios shut down like back in back in march mm -hmm. basically every every major studio had to end production whether it was on their tv shows their movies whatever they were doing while while they figured out the new protocols yeah. uh funimation is now a division of sony yeah. and for several months funimation was the only division of sony globally that was producing new content mm -hmm. because we were able to go to our home studios. We were able to figure out ways to, you know, and, and I, I credit Funimation for being really proactive and coming up with a plan and getting equipment out to actors that needed it, figure out who had the ability to do it, shuffle some cast around, but be able to keep recording. And, uh, and so, yeah, they were the only, the only game in town for a long time that was still putting out new content. And it was really impressive. And they really, tried to take care of their actors too which is you know unheard of in most places yeah and just it's just impressive like they just before anybody asked they were stepping up going hey we know this is crazy here's some things we want to do to help and so i was i was real impressed with the way that they dealt with the uh the ensuing chaos that became the pandemic well hats off to funimation and yeah you brought something up that i really wanted to, to circle back to um one <clears throat> excuse me one being you said uh, earlier in the podcast uh, you had started interviewing, so it was going back to something you used to do. What did you allude to that you used to do before you do now? <laughs> I should have never said that. Um, <laughs> I, I, back in an, in an earlier life, for a brief period of time, I was the, the host of Good Morning Texas, the morning oh. TV Good Morning America knockoff that we had in, here in Dallas. And, what was your uh, sign-off? um god please get me out of this at least that's in my head that's that's what i was saying i was saying god, i'm really not good at this <laughs> I, should, I should be doing something else um which was pretty much what all of the managers of the tv station also thought so it was a fairly short-lived short-lived run i did get to meet c3po anthony daniels so i guess it was worth it if if, if only for that i got to do that how hard did you fanboy out? I had my parents ship my life-size C-3PO <laughs> cardboard cutout that had been in my bedroom since 1977 from the attic, and they shipped it, and he signed it live on stage. Did you? Uh, it was pretty who, great. Who was it? Um, are you a big movie guy? Uh, Step brother. I am a big movie guy. All right, hold that thought. Two seconds. I'm going to plug in because I battery. And with the power of magic, we're back, right? So... Yes. Uh, fanboying out is one thing I, I always like because the first time I ever met somebody I guess famous in a sense for me my first comic book convention I went to um here in Orlando and my favorite writer of all time Scott Snyder not sure if you're a big Batman fan but he, he was writing the longest run at least for you know DC's uh what was it the new 52 wrote the entire Batman run um and I'm sitting there and I've got my my favorite book that I that I ever read or that he ever wrote and I'm sitting there, I'm shaking and shit. And I'm a pretty big, I'm six foot two. And this guy is a very, very small guy. He's like maybe five, nine. So I'm sitting there, I'm shaking. You know, I was like, oh, Mr. Snyder, this is, he's like, no, 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 just, just call me Scott. It's okay. I was like, this is my first comic book convention. I've never been to one before. Um, I got picked on a lot when I was a kid for liking people like Aquaman. And I didn't like the Aquaman that's, that's today, boys and girls. 
my Aquaman was a super friends Aquaman, that really, really feminine character that nobody liked. All he did was talk to fish. I loved Aquaman, by uh, the he's way. He's fantastic, man. And everybody keeps forgetting that like he could go toe to toe with Wonder Woman and superman he is a god among men type of thing but nobody really all they thought about was like oh he just rode that seahorse that he had that bullshit you know superpower and i got punched for that one numerous times but i'm sitting there i was like i got i, I love this book and then he's like oh man this is one of my favorite books to write and then greg capula was sitting next to him the artist for the series oh wow yeah and then he goes he's like dude you remember this cover and then Greg comes up and he didn't have anybody in line yet. Somebody else was coming. He was like, oh, shit. He was like, this is one of my favorite covers. And I'm just like, uh, <laughs> uh, what is going? This is like greatness and royalty sitting right here. And they're like, they're talking to me like I'm normal. I was like, I don't, I don't know what to say at this point. I don't know what to do with my hands. Um, oh, that's what I was getting to um, earlier with Step Brothers. Um, but that guy, oh, shit, I can't remember. He played um, Will Ferrell's brother, um, Derek. He was the uh, just the real douchebag of the character, but he met um, Mark Hamill from uh, from obviously Star Wars. Star Wars, right? Um, and then he comes out and they start playing the music. Or the Joker from the Batman animated series, also a very fine performance. But continue. That and he played Skips. <laughs> if you really want to go deep, because he played Skips in the regular show. If you've never watched that one, a fantastic show. Um, but that's the voice I hear whenever I read Batman comics. Kevin Conroy is Batman. Absolutely. Mark Hamill is the Joker. Hundred um, percent. But uh. So he comes out on live TV on one of these talk shows and he's just Adam Lane or Adam Scott or some shit like that. I think is his name or Adam McKay. can't remember. Um, but he starts just bawling in tears and he comes out like Luke Skywalker himself, like Jesus rose. And this is what this guy's looking at. This man's hero. And just to see you guys that are, you know, like I said, up on a pedestal to us, us fans to see you guys like nerd out and then like have that moment where you're like, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, what the fuck do I say to this guy? Uh, sign my book, please. Right. It was, it, it's crazy and it's weird. And also it's very humanizing. Cause you're like, these guys produce this stuff. These guys make this stuff. These guys say this stuff on this thing I like. And you guys go through some of the same shit that we go through when we meet people like you, right? So did you well, get- Well, I'm like you, I, I'm, I, I am not as, uh, I like the creators, right? Yeah. So like, I'm gonna nerd out over a director or a writer yeah, or like, oh, you were the showrunner for Deadwood. You're a god. And <laughs> supposed to, of the necessarily the people that were on characters, because I know more of what went into the behind the scenes. They were like, oh, you directed the pilot and also episode seven mm -hmm. of uh, like Battlestar Galactica. And then went on to do, uh, directed uh, Friday Night Lights. That's the guy that I'm excited about talking to. Well, th those are fantastic people too. The writers are somebody that never really, you always talk to the people that, you know, take the words that somebody wrote. And sometimes you guys ad lib. A lot of times most people ad lib stuff and they pick stuff from things, they cut it into the show and that's what you get. Um, you know, so the writers are one of those guys and then music composers as well. Um, I don't know if you were a big cartoon fan back in the day, but you remember a little cartoon called Hey Arnold? Called what? Hey Arnold. Oh yeah. So I mean, the music as well as the store was almost synonymous. You couldn't have one without the other. Right. Very rarely do you have a show, a movie, you know, what have you, that they're so simpatico. It's so just everything goes together like that one did. Um, but when you were sitting there talking to C-3PO, what was going through your head? Like It was crazy. Like, like, a lot of it was just keep it together, keep it together, keep it together, keep it together. Don't cry, don't cry. But don't. also it was super impressive that this guy, and I'm sure it went through, you know, Anthony Daniels is one of those that was an actor, was a stage actor and got this thing, you know, at one point in his career and had no idea that was going to be the defining moment. And I'm sure there are points in his life where he's like, oh my God, this is not all I have done with my life. I am not C-3PO. Why don't you see all the other? But at this point in his career, he was coming into voice. Like they were doing a, a story version of the music of Star Wars with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. And he was like narrating that. He's still getting to go around and do cool things and, and have the fans come out. And it's just super grateful. And I'm sure they all go through this point of like, get away from me. I'm sick of all this. Yeah. But to see the ones that have come back to like, no, I love that I did something that you love. And I'm not upset about it. Like he, one, of the, one of the other women on the show, her husband was a huge Star Wars fan and he couldn't come get away from work. So Anthony Daniels took her phone and called and left him a voicemail 
That is sweet. And I'm like, who does that when they've been bar barraged with this for 40 years and still is cool enough to, to take time and do things for people. That was, that's the impress. That's the things that impressed me more, even than meeting the people, but realizing that, you know, some of them are very much caught up in their own narratives, but there's a lot of them that are just happy to be there. And, and even, you know, the brutal expense of a comic con of just getting down and, 300 people a day coming in and, and wanting signatures that the people that stay engaged and are like, no, tell me about you. Why did you like this? That's the ones that are the most impressive to me. It, it just goes to show you like maybe they were raised right. Or maybe it's something they learned to grow into, or maybe it's just somebody they had that kind of took them under their wing. is like, this is how you treat people. Just talk to people normally. Talk to people like you'd want to be treating. You know, it's that, it's that old mom's type of type of line or, you know, the lyric from the mom song. It's like, I just treat everybody how you want to be treated. Right. Um, like I said, it's fantastic when you guys, when we get to meet guys like you or get, you get to meet your heroes and then it's like, God, man, this is a cool fucking guy, man. I mean, well, the, I think another factor of it also is that we've, no matter what level of the business in either our little niche of it or the bigger, you know, Hollywood end of the niche of, of the, of the sphere, I get the, what am I trying to say of the spectrum? Yeah, if you're you at the top end or whatever, if you've been in the entertainment world at all, you realize that nothing is guaranteed, that there's a million super talented people that are never gonna get anything. And if you get any modicum of success, you know it is a huge amount of luck and you should be really grateful. And of course there are people that forget that along the way, but I think enough, <laughs> enough people have seen enough failure and had enough failure and rejection in their own life that when the time comes, because that's the nature of that world. Yeah. That, that you know, Every every character you book is is a is a result of a hundred auditions you did not book, and so hopefully they were able to keep some of that of that perspective and say, yeah, I'm just lucky to get to do anything that worked out. Uh, like I said, that's a fantastic way to really look at it, and not just in your industry, but more people could really look at that and take that as a mindset or a philosophy or a credo or just a way of life to really strive for. You know, um, it doesn't really have to be. It doesn't have to come from the top, man. You got to build a foundation. You don't just go and throw some shit on the ground and hopefully it stays up with wind and rain and all that other stuff. You really got to build it from the ground up. You got to have a nice foundation. Um, now with everything that you've done, right? We talked about your past, but I want to know what are you doing now that you're really, really excited about that you can talk about? Well, things that I can talk about, I, um, I still, okay. One of the things that takes a lot of my time is I work with a company that produces corporate training videos, which does not sound exciting. <laughs> but uh, it's a British company and, and we have been making a project for a company called Know Before that is a series on loosely on IT security training. Okay. But they really just let us make a cool Netflix style show, mm -hmm. like our own Mr. Robot That's about cool. a group of hackers. And, and so if anyone listening works for a Know Before company, look for the inside man, just because it was fun to actually get to make like, way more entertainment than bullet point information transition. And so that was fun. And then figuring out we're on season three now and I couldn't go over to London for the shoot. So I'm like getting up at 2.30 in the morning and watching the monitor via Wi-Fi feed to my phone and like texting with the director, like, oh, that should be in his left hand. Cause it was in his right, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Like sitting there on my porch in Dallas and monitoring a shoot from London was pretty cool and made me realize like we are living in the future. Like we really are kind of doing things. Um, and then in terms of, of podcasts, um, which as, as you well know, there are, there are dozens of dollars to be made podcasting. Uh, I don't know dozens. yet. I, I don't know. Dozens, yet. dozens of dozens, maybe tens of dozens of dollars to be made. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, uh, I've worked uh, producing a podcast called 1865 that is a historical fiction uh, narrative audio drama about the aftermath of the assassination of Lincoln and kind of that period of history and reconstruction. A lot of great voice actors, a lot of anime, a lot of Funimation voice actors that appeared in that. Jeremy Schwartz is our lead, Michael Tatum, J. Michael Tatum. Is it already out? Part in that. Yeah, it's out and and doing really well and then we're about to do a mini season and then come up with a second season but it, it it's uh on the wondery platform right now but you can get it anywhere yeah um but it's uh it, it was really fun to get to work that and realize like oh we have a great largely because of funimation mm -hmm. 
we have a great pool of voice acting talent in Dallas and they can do amazing things, things that probably Hollywood people can't do because they're not used to using just their voice. Um, and so, and again, incredible music score and, and, and story composition, amazing writing. And uh, it was written by a guy named Steve Walters who actually wrote a number of, of Funimation scripts over the years. Again, that out of work artists fund, everybody gets through Funimation at some point in time, but he wrote scripts there and then went on and has been a Hollywood screenwriter and TV writer and then uh, came back to Dallas to, to work on this podcast project. And it, it's really done well. I think we're past the 3 million download Jesus. Uh, point for for season one right now so that's exciting um and i i play a voice role in it mostly out of necessity and of course you hate your own voice and everything <laughs> i'm like why did i cast somebody else to do that why do i have to listen to myself do this role um but yeah it's 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 fun and the idea of na narrative podcasting is something that we're really working to explore and, and look at more um as opposed to you know this kind of interview interview thing, we really wanted to do something that was almost throwback to those old 1940s radio plays, yeah. and see what you can do because you can do anything. Like you got a story about you know outer space with the flying elephant. Like you can't afford to make that on your own. You got to go find a studio with the budget to make the visual version of that. But you can uh, you can just do the audio of that. Just figure out what a space elephant sounds like, and you're good to go. <laughs> There's, there's a few of them out there, and uh, I can't think of the name, but Remy Malik was in one of them. Um, and there's two of these that I've actually listened to, and I'm glad you, you, you said 1865, because I'm going to check that out as soon as we get off of here. Um, I, I, growing up, my, my grandpa would always listen to talk radio whenever we'd go and visit him, and I absolutely hated talk radio. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to listen to music. It was the same thing whenever I'd go over to his house or my great aunt and uncle, my Aunt Mary and Uncle Bob. They would always come down. And essentially during the summer when they would watch us, because my mom was working two jobs and we weren't even in fourth grade yet at this point. Um, so we, they would come down and they were essentially couch potatoes the entire summer because they're old as shit. Um, it was hot in Florida. Nobody liked, you know, being here in Florida because the skeeters, the, the humidity and just the heat alone would just sap my-, my, my What's brain. not to love? I, well, I mean, <laughs> <they're>, <laughs> I'm not even going to go down the, the Florida route. I, we went down that rabbit hole a few times on this podcast and it always comes up really, really weird. It's a very weird place to live. Um, as you can tell, every horrible story you hear, methed up gators or a gator with a knife sticking out of its head that somehow had meth in a system, essentially comes from Florida. Um, it's nothing to be proud of, but it's always interesting to live here. If not, no, okay. So so you're, you're, you're listening to radio dramas or to audio, you know, oh. talk radio. Oh, yeah. So and then they would come down and watch us. And all we did was watch TV land. I always wanted to watch cartoons. Um, so between my uh, that stuff and then um, just the talk radio alone, I hated anything really old. Right. So coming into podcasting, I always shit on it back in the day. And it always seems like anything I shit on that's good. Right. Before I even give it a shot. I was like, I turned around and like, man, I should have really given this a shot back in the day. <laughs> Um, you know, My Hero podcast, talk radio, you know, all these old TV shows that I was just forced to watch, like Walker, Texas Ranger, In the Heat of the Night, all these great TV shows now, right? Um, and then just sitting there. And the last thing I wanted to hear is a narr narrative story, like the one with Rami Malek or the one that they did with Wolverine. They did the, like the Long Night or some shit like that. Yeah. Fantastic. And to, to find out that there's a new one, and it's during probably up until now, the most, what is it, tumultuous time in our country at that time 1865 with everything yeah, and going with on. crazy parallels to current events that was a strange thing we wrote it in in 2016 2017 and then all of these things started coming out because it's about the first time that a sitting president was impeached yeah. uh it is about the sitting president firing the person in charge of the est investigation into his possible collusion with an enemy and that mm -hmm. firing triggers his impeachment i'm like oh okay so we're not on such uncharted ground. And he was not impeached and stayed in office and you know, worked really hard to change the direction of the country that his predecessor had put into place. So there's a lot of parallels, no matter. And it's also just the history. Like we tried not to put a huge perspective on it. Yeah. Um, and we also did an inside the episode for each episode so we could talk about what was real, what was creative license, what's based on the history, where would that history come That's from? That's fantastic because most people- So you can kind of do the deep dive. 
interesting yeah. the stuff that was the most crazy and that I was clearly like, oh, you made that up because it's a good story. <laughs> Those were the things that were totally real. Yeah. And the things that were kind of boring and like, yeah, that probably makes sense. Like, oh no, we totally made that up. <laughs> Isn't it funny how history always tends to kind of repeat itself, right? Always, yeah. Similarities, parallels, adjacents, whatever you want to call it. Everything starts to kind of start out like this and then everything starts to kind of Weave back well, as, as many times as the word unprecedented has been said over the last three years or so, the only, only thing there is truly precedent for is that every year something unprecedented happens in, yeah, the, you know, 200 years of our history, but probably the thousand years of 2000 years of human recorded history, whatever, more like 10,000, but let's get on. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, nothing is precedented. We find interesting ways to throw wrenches in our own works all the time. Yeah, I mean, it is crazy. And I don't want to go down this rabbit hole because we can sit here and talk about it. We've already been talking for an hour at this point. Um, you know, so we're gonna start winding it down because I got a kid coming home and he's into karate. So he's probably gonna, as soon as he comes in, he likes to load up and then just kick the shit out of me. I don't know if that's just a son and a dad type of thing, but I'm how I treat everybody when they come over for food, he treats me like a punching bag. He's like, let me see. If I, I think that could be the outro to each of your, your podcasts. Like, hey, thanks for joining us. That's the show for the day. And then quick cut, you getting kicked in the crotch. Oh, shit. Nah, oh, no. I, I just think I, that's your out. That's your out for every episode. That's like your signature sign off. See, I like taking sign offs that don't put my balls in my throat. Um, you know, because he can kick really fucking hard. Um, and, and there's been a couple times where I've just been coming down the stairs and usually I have to wake him up, right? He's a 10 year old. He just doesn't want to get up when he's supposed to get up. You know, he stays up too late sometimes. Um, but there was a couple times last week and the week before last even where he had just earned his purple belt. And I'm walking down the stairs, happy. It's not even seven o'clock in the morning. And usually, like I said, I got to wake him up, but he's already downstairs. So I'm like, oh shit, he must want something. He's already dressed. He's already let the dogs out. He's already started his breakfast. I mean, he's, he's on to something and he wants something. That's what I was thinking, right? And, you know, my head's going all of these different directions. And then as soon as I come around the corner, whack, a kick before seven o'clock in the morning, <laughs> across my stomach, that just I'm like, ah, shit. He was, I was like, what was that for? He was like, well, you beat me in Smash Brothers yesterday. And then you tried to leg sweep me like in Cobra Kai. And he was like, I had to get you before you got me. So I win today, dad. And I was like, shit, all of this logic checks out all of these <laughs> It seems See, like now and the rest of the day, it doesn't matter what we say on the rest of this podcast. All you're going to be thinking about is, is he going to kick you in the stomach on the way home? Oh, That's what's in your head. Yeah. He's, he's, he's got, See? but I tied it back to the brand. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. You should start writing this stuff, man. <laughs> but like I said, as we wind down, cause I don't want to keep it too much longer, even though I'm having fun. Hopefully you are too. Um, you said stain even though it was so short lived and you didn't seem like the same fulfillment, I guess. I don't know if that was the right word, if I'm just projecting here and that's the word I wanted to use um, because you didn't get to do as much as you've done with like one piece or Dragon Ball Z, you know, with other characters that you've had such a good long time to just really flesh out that character, that being, or that feeling. Right. But looking back at it, what characters would you say if you had to pick two or three that you've had the most fun playing? Okay. That's a fair question. I've had similar versions of that question, but that's in a little different vein. So I'll start thinking about it in terms of most fun. Um, uh, Stain is kind of, uh, I would say, uh, an, ant uh, uh, an antecedent mm -hmm. that it runs. There are some character lines that run back to the very first bad guy that I ever got to do mm -hmm. in terms of like really evil and does horrible things, but from a very noble and seemingly, at least in their world perspective, moral place. That anti uh, feel. The first bad guy I got to do in anime, because I'd been doing all the young hero, the teen Goten, okay guys, we can do it, it's gonna be great. And, and I kept lobbying all of the, the directors at the time. I'm like, hey, I have a lower register. I can do other things. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. you're fine, you're fine. Finally, uh, uh, Justin Cook let me audition for the bad guy in a show called Yu Yu Hakusho, mm -hmm. which is another one of those big kind of tentpole early anime shows that was a starting point for a lot of people in their fandoms. Um, and, and got to be the bad guy who was named uh, Sensui and uh, Sonobu Sensui. And he was in that same way of like a, a bad guy that you weren't sure how you felt about. 
And so that was probably one of my most fun, also just because I finally got to do the deep voiced bad guy. Like my favorite sensory line was, oh, that's right, I'm killing you. I'm sorry, I got distracted. Like you don't get to say that in normal life. Like that's just not a line you're gonna get to say without getting arrested. So I mean, if you come to Florida, you probably hear it at least twice. Well, that's probably true. <laughs> There's a lot of things said in Duval County that you shouldn't Duval. be repeated elsewhere. Duval! Um, <laughs> The uh, go Jaguars. It's not pretty. It's not pretty. Uh, um, the uh, has another shout out for Aaron Robert Duval. Aaron Roberts, anime's fan and Duval County's own rising star. Um, the uh, so that was a great character that I really got to enjoy. There was a little show called uh, not a little show, but there was a show called Psychopaths. Mm -hmm. That was a, a two episodes and a movie and. Uh, but I really, really dug it. It's a really cool show in terms of it's just psychology. It's about a futuristic world where government police control is now melded with a computer system that decides people's innocent and guilt and, and, and all of the questions around that. So in a little ways, it's a little minority report meets, I don't know what, but the character in that that I got to play was one of my favorites because he was super dry and super calm, but went through a real arc. Um, so I really liked Kogami in, in Psycho Pass. Um, and, then, and then there was a show called Sands of Destruction where I played a one-eyed talking bear called Akuma. And part of their race's honor to themselves is that they said the word Kuma at the end of every sentence. Yeah. So he would say, I have come Kuma to make sure Kuma that we will win the day Kuma. And then just for some reason always made me happy to play a one-eyed I play a lot of one-eyed characters and a lot of characters that have something in their mouth all the time. I don't know why that is. Cigarette, stalk of a pipe, a stalk of straw, something. Like, I guess when people see one-eyed characters now in anime, they go, oh, we need to call Rob in for that. That's a Rob character. <laughs> we need them to have a pipe and they need to be distinguished. Um, <laughs> so. uh, but yeah, I mean, like, like I said, I have had such fun doing this as I have a slight stroke there. I've had such fun doing this episode, man. It's been a lot of fun. We talked about a whole bunch of different shit but, uh, you know, I feel like we kind of fleshed out a lot of stuff that Stain really didn't get to flesh out. And I'm talking to you guys. We really want to see this guy back. So please bring back Stain. Um, what can people, where can people find you at the end of the day when they want to reach out and they want to say, hey, man, I really love what you did. Or um, when conventions start opening back up, where can they find more about Rob? Well, because I am super lame uh, <laughs> and have not been good on the marketing front. Uh, which was the thing I swore I was going to do at the beginning of lockdown. Like, I got all this time now. I mean, the, the Facebook fan page is still the best and kind of only way. There's a, there's a Twitter feed and there's an Instagram that I don't do anything on, but the, the, the Facebook fan page, Robert McCollum voice actor fan page, is the best way to send things and post things. And, and I'm getting much better about answering it and posting things on it these days. That is the best way to do it. Uh, and then just keep watching, man. I don't care if I'm in the show or not. Just uh, everybody keep finding things that, stories that make them excited and keep firing it up, getting fired up about it and telling other people about it. That's the most important thing to me. Well, shit, man. I couldn't figure out any other way because I'm not going to let my kid knock me in the nads. There's no way in hell I want to do that as far as a closing or an ending statement or wrapping it up. So we're just going to do it this way because it's less pain on me and less feeling of my kid seeming like he wins. Um, so we're going to do it like this. He's been Robert Stain. Any other character you could possibly do, a young Goten, and I can't pronounce the other characters because I don't want to butcher it and just <laughs> annihilate it in the comments because that's happened before. Um, but, man, like I said, that's been Robert. I've been Julian. We're out of time. I had such fun, man. Thank you again for doing this, and stay safe out there. All right. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for having me on What's in Your Head. Thanks, brother. You stay safe, man. I'd love to talk to you down the road whenever season five gets coming back out. Hopefully you can do a character. Hopefully it's staying, but it's not going to be staying. But hopefully you can get at least another character in here so we can keep hearing your voice. Thanks so much, man. We'll talk to you soon. No problem, brother. Take it easy. And end of podcast. There we go. Good job, man. <laughs> that was you. great. I'm glad. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. If you want to put the, the Facebook fan page, it is so lame that that's all I have. But if you want to put that link in the comment section or whatever, that'd be great. And, uh, and 1865. Yeah. You should check it out. I, I'm not bragging my own horn because I didn't write it, but it is some of the coolest voice acting 
in terms of just very real. It sounds like you're watching an indie film. Uh-huh. It does not feel like I am an actor in front of a microphone. It's just, it, you feel the whole thing. And then the, the crazy things that actually went on and that are real in that time, I think you'd probably dig it. Yeah, man, I'll give it a listen. I've already got it written down right here. And I forgot to hit pause. So my, my Larry, my guy's going to have to, you know, edit some of the stuff out. So Woo, thanks, Larry. Yeah, he's the greatest. So, but uh, yeah, I'm for sure going to check it.